Hello and welcome. The last session at the World Economic Forum in Davos is a global economic outlook. And what I thought we'd do over the next uh, several minutes here at the Business Today Market Summit is to do an India economic outlook with some very sharp economic minds. And the global consensus seems to be that the world could potentially be able to avoid a hard landing in a deep recession and instead get away with a softer landing and slowing growth. What does that mean in the context of the India growth story? We have a big budget coming up in just a few days from now. Crucial also because this is arguably the last budget before the election cycle kicks in. So what can Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman and the Modi government do to capitalize on the unique global headwinds and tailwinds that are uh, playing out at this moment. So to talk about this at the Business Today Market Today Summit, I want to introduce our panel of guests, starting with Pranjal Bandari, Chief Economist, India at HSBC. Uh, flanking her, Samir on Chakrabarti, Chief Economist, India at Citibank, and Soumya Kanti Ghosh Group, Chief Economic Advisor at the State Bank of India. So let me start by asking uh, Pranjal about what do you think Finance Minister Sita Raman can do at this moment to try and make most of the global tailwinds that seem to be blowing in India's favor. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, I think the best thing that can be done now is to keep the budget boring. Uh, and by boring, I mean keep it predictable, keep it credible, and just go on the path which you've promised. Now, uh, you know, we talk a lot about growth. But in a year like 2023, when there's a lot of uncertainty globally, I think the best thing that we can do in India is maintain macro stability. And macro stability means low inflation, fiscal consolidation, lower trade deficit than what we had last year. Because if the stage is set with macro stability, when the global uh, economy turns and rises again uh, in the next couple of quarters, hopefully, uh, India will be ready for a takeoff. So I think the budget should be boring. It should basically focus more on macro stability rather than high growth. And from that perspective, I think uh, the path is very clear. Uh, the, you know, the, the finance minister has already spoken about a fiscal consolidation path, bringing down the fiscal deficit from 6.5% to 4.5% over the next three years. It should really you know, focus on that path. Of course, on the background, some changes can happen, for instance, improving uh, the tax regime, and we can come back to that later, uh, and also focusing on CapEx, which has been a thrust of the government, but mostly focusing on continuity rather than doing something dramatic and big bang. Given the emphasis that we've seen on public spending and capital expenditure, uh, do you see that continuing, or do you think it's reached a level where the government will need to start cutting back some even to some extent? What do you think can be done in this unique moment uh, for India to try and step on the accelerator on economic growth? Uh, clearly, Rahul, I would say that uh, investment, investment, and investment. Uh, I think in the last year's budget, if you look at, this was the theme of the budget. We don't change themes every year. So there is a need to continue with that theme. And our sense is that not only in rupees trillion terms, but also as a percentage of GDP, there's a need to increase the public capex part. And increasingly what the central government is realizing is that uh, it's only a limited areas where the central government can make a lot of capex. The power lies often with the state governments. So it's quite keen to deliver a larger amount of resources to the state governments to spend as well. But when I speak to bureaucrats and ministers in the government, what I find is a growing sense of unstated frustration with the fact that when it comes to spending, the government is having to do the heavy lifting. And despite the deep and sharp reduction in corporate taxes, private investment isn't stepping up to the plate. And I think Nirmala Sitaraman has publicly spoken up about this a couple of times, nudging India Inc. to do more when it comes to investment. But that, for some reason, doesn't seem to be happening. So I don't think there is any other option but to be patient. Uh, we have to understand that even pre-pandemic, India was going through a pretty slow growth compared to what India's history has been. And the pandemic has obviously had a, almost two years of low growth. And now with 
this whole geopolitical uncertainties, it's difficult for private capex to immediately pick up given the background that we have seen of last five, six years. But what we have to also keep in mind is that we are now reaching almost all the preconditions that are required for a private capex recovery. Look at corporate balance sheets. If you look at the financial system balance sheets, we haven't seen this kind of a balance sheet in almost a decade. So with the right kind of public capex and the policy thrust that is there towards manufacturing that this government has put forward, I think it's just a matter of time we will see a private capex recovery. But Samya Kanti goes, this is something that the pundits have been saying for a long time, that capacity utilization is in the mid-70s. India is poised for a multi-year investment cycle, an investment cycle which so far hasn't kicked off in right earnest. Why? And do you think, like Samiran, that that's now finally about to change? Yeah, thank you, Rahul. No, I think that uh, last two years uh, during the pandemic, if you look into the corporate balance sheet, they have significantly deleveraged. And so that's the first thing. So that's one of the preconditions for investment taking off. The second point to note is that if you actually look into the bank credit today, credit growth actually has continued to expand, even though there has been some moderation in the recent week. And a large part of this credit growth is not only the working capital requirement, which typically comes when the inflation is on the higher side, but also term loans and also some project announcements, as we are seeing in our books. So, so my, in my sense, I think there is evidence of a pickup in private investment activity. May not be that encompassing, which all of us want, to, want it to happen. But at this point of time, if I look into the sectors, which is deleverage, uh, uh, like steel, like, uh, I mean, the metal sector, there is evidence of, I mean, some amount of private investment picking up. But as we progress, and as basically as all of you, also, as, as also there has been a lot of geopolitical conflict and uncertainty. So I think as, this, as the fog clears on the global economy also, I am sure that the investment is going to take off in a meaningful manner. One of the Modi government's big thrust areas is to boost manufacturing and to take manufacturing to 25% of India's GDP. The needle hasn't moved much when it comes to the ratio of manufacturing as a percentage of GDP. In Vietnam, it has. And the big question in India and globally is to what extent is India being able to benefit from a global realignment of supply chains with many global corporations looking at an India plus one strategy? Is, Pranjal, in your view, India likely to be the prime beneficiary or just one of the multiple beneficiaries of this realignment? Yeah, I think the good news is that India has gained a global market share in some high-tech sectors like mobile phones, drugs and pharma, automobile parts, and IT services. So that's the good news. But the problem is that we are actually losing global market share in trade in medium tech and low tech. For example, te uh, textiles, for example, uh, small electronics, uh, for example, agricultural products. I think our problem is why our manufacturing to GDP share is not rising dramatically like, for example, Vietnam that you mentioned is our industrial structure. We have too many, too small firms which never grow over time. You know, we call it the economic dwarfs. You know, there can be different names to it. The problem is if there are too many, too small firms, they never gain economies of scale. They never become too efficient to sort of, you know, really compete on a global level. And that is, I think, a real problem. And I think the big challenge is how do you let small firms grow from small to medium to large, which is something in our country we don't see too much so of. I had a fascinating conversation with Raghuram Rajan Pranjal uh, at the World Economic Forum about manufacturing and electronics. And his argument, and I'm curious to know what you think, is that PLIs is basically subsidy for capitalists, that there is very little value add happening. And while, of course, manufacturing is growing up, there's nothing to Tom Tom about in terms of it being a big achievement for the government, uh, that this is money that could be more wisely spent in things like higher education, produce more engineers, that has a higher ROI than just giving money through subsidies to corporates. You know, my sense is the PLI scheme is an experiment worth doing. You know, we are trying to sort of, uh, you know, look into futuristic sectors and ensure that, you know, uh, India at least tries 
right? And, and, and the other reason why I think we should do it is because uh, it's actually not very costly. Uh, barring the semiconductors, it's just over 2 trillion rupees spread over 5 to 6 years, which is our one-year fertilizer subsidy bill. Uh, so it's not that much money. And even within that, the money was made possible by retiring some old export subsidy schemes. So there was like smart thinking done there, uh, and I think this is uh, in a, an experiment worth doing. But is this enough? Will this change India's you know, future? Will it make it a big manufacturing hub? I don't think. You know, I think a lot more needs to be done. Most importantly, I think overall business climate needs to improve in a way that small firms can grow and become large over time. Samiran, especially on the issue of value-add, opinion seems very divided amongst pundits on the efficacy of production-linked incentives. Are they working in your view, or are they not working in the way they should? So, Rahul, I mean, in a very broad sense, economists will always argue against uh, subsidies in any context, whether it is the context of in manufacturing or it is the context of food subsidies. But having said that, uh, the way to think about PLI, in my view, is that uh, is it going to be enough to move companies who were thinking about investing in other geographies to come to India? Is that going to give that extra bit of uh, leverage to us? And in that context, it's very important that the first few PLI schemes are success. Because I can tell you from my experience that a lot of uh, foreign companies are thinking about India, but they are also fighting a perception battle that in the past, investing in India has been difficult. So if there are some companies which can show that, yes, India has changed and it's possible to do business in India and be profitable, then a lot of players who are waiting in the wings can also join into the scheme. While Pranjul is making a very valid point that the extent of subsidy is still very limited. It's less than 1% of GDP by our current GDP standards. The critical thing is that the sectors on which PLI is there is also less than 1% of GDP. So even if that less than 1% of GDP grows at a very fast pace, that's not going to move the overall GDP growth needle. So either we have to think of this as an experiment which brings in more investment in other non-PLI sectors, or we will have to expand PLI to a vast many sectors for us to see the whole macro impact of PLI. Otherwise, what's going to happen is that this year we will be discussing PLI. Next year, when you are going to call me, you are going to find another acronym, and we will keep on discussing that acronym without having the continuity that we require. Soumya Kanti Ghosh, you're very bullish on some of the policy moves that the Modi government has made and their potential impact on Indian economic growth. But like we were hearing in the conversation with market experts before this, the fact that this is India's moment is not being said for the first time. Now, this is something that's been said multiple times in multiple years gone by. And therefore, what makes you confident that this is truly India's moment? Because in the past, we've had the knack of finding some way of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory or you know, not being able to capitalize on the moment like we should. Yeah, thank you, Rahul. I, I think I'll just very quickly quote some data points to support the point that Indian economy is actually placed in a sweet spot. The first is that look into the banking sectors. The net NPA is now at 10-year low. Credit growth is at 10-year high. Look into the digitization. The total number of UPI transactions this year is already touching 100 trillion. That could actually go up to 130 to 35 trillion at this rate, which could be 45% of India's GDP at, uh, in the current year. Look into the SME sector. The overall credit growth in the current year, 10% is being contributed by the SME sector. And there is now clear evidence that a part of the SME sector is actually getting bigger. That means they are moving up the value chain. This, then there is the uh, look into the external sector, export data. Even if we last year we did 420 billion, at the current rate we could actually do around 450 billion. This is apart from the services data. Tax to GDP ratio this year could be at the highest level and India is the only country which has increased and seen an improvement in the tax GDP ratio. 
So there is compelling evidence of the data supporting that we are in a sweet spot. And But the fact is that we need to take advantage of that. In the past also we had done, even, even in the external sector, we have already recouped more than 50% of the foreign exchange reserves, which is at the lowest level at the end of October. So in rupee, in real terms, it is actually appreciated if you look into the BSI data. So household debt to GDP ratio, look into the latest BSI data, it has actually now declined from the peak in March 2022. So on all counts, we are in a sweet spot. The point is, where do we grow from here? Okay, so let's come to that because we saw recently the World Bank enhanced India's growth forecast from 6.8% to 7% to for this fiscal. I'll start by asking Pranjal first for her broad sense uh, for how the Indian economy is likely to grow next year. Yeah, I think next year is going to be a bit turbulent uh, and growth is going to slow down for a couple of reasons. One is global trade is slowing. You know, you mentioned that a lot of people are not expecting a hard landing, but it's still slowing across the world. We can see trade volumes that we track very easily slowing. So exports will slow and exports are important because they were a big driver of our growth when we bounced back from the pandemic. Then if you look at our consumers, a lot of the pent-up demand after the pandemic is now done. You know, if you look at the deposits at bank, they are back to pre-pandemic levels. And then you have a government which is trying to bring down the fiscal deficit. Fiscal consolidation in the short run can take away from growth. So I think for all of these reasons, we will see growth softening uh, in 2023. Uh, but we should not worry about it. We should focus about macro stability, keeping inflation low, bringing down fiscal deficit. Because once the global cycle turns, I think India today is really geared for a takeoff. And I would uh, agree with uh, Shomya Kanti Ghosh on many of these points he's made. I think there are two very exciting sectors, high skill exports where India is doing well, and then the entire tech startups. I know it's slowing a little bit right now, but this consolidation is good. I think in the medium term, our tech startups can find a lot of digital answers to real-world economy problems. At this problems. moment, what's your estimate for growth for next year? For next year, we have growth at about 5.5%. But after that, we have growth going back to 6% plus. At this moment, you have no intention of revising upwards the growth figures from what no. you did previously. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Samira, how do you see India's growth outlook for next year? Pranjal was mentioning that there are some headwinds to deal with, but the way I generally want to look at this number is that if you look at last uh, two decades, uh, on an average, consumption has always contributed about 400 basis points to GDP growth or about 4% becomes like an absolute bottom for us. And on top of it, if we get just about 7% investment growth, we are at 6% overall GDP growth. So I think 6% kind of becomes a number which is quite achievable. On top of it... So you're the, slightly more bullish than Pranjal is. Yes, I am. Uh, I think that the current data is not supporting a slowing economy. So there is right now a big disconnect between the data and the narrative. The narrative is more negative as some of the things that got discussed earlier about headwinds coming from global slowdown, headwinds coming from fiscal contraction, monetary tightening. But you look across all high-frequency data, there is barely any slowdown in that. We are still running at a rate uh, which is almost pre-COVID growth. So I think I will be slightly more optimistic on achieving a growth number of closer to six next year. Uh, but uh, obviously global headwinds can change. So we are things. getting more optimistic as we go from right to left, from five and a half to six. Samya Gandhi Ghosh, are you taking the needle up even further? No, I think uh, I would tend to agree with Samirana's point. We are a little higher than six percent. I think one possible advantage next year is that prices will actually be rapidly cooling off. So, uh, I mean, for example, oil prices... Also, the fact is that the globally, uh, domestically, I think inflation possibly has seen the what's the peak, and inflation will progressively come down next year. Food prices has been surprising even after such a bad weather in the last three months. I think unseasonal risk, food prices have behaved remarkably well. And with a 46% weightage in the overall CPI basket, if inflation behaves well, which is doing right now, and actually it has surprised a lot of the market expectations, uh, expectations and forecasts. I think the stage could be set for an 
positive GDP surprise next year because all GDP numbers last year, I think there is a disconnect between the leading indicators and the GDP. Last quarter GDP, the forecast which the NSO gives out 7%, I think that was nobody was expecting. So I think that next year we could see a positive surprise on a back of a relatively stable macro environment where inflation will not be an uh, evil as we have seen this year. Now, one of the reasons why uh, so many global companies are bullish on India at this moment is also because what's happening in China. But on China, opinion is divided. Pranjal, the one sense is that China's decline in terms of economic growth is now permanent. Their, uh, the number of old people is growing up, the youthful population, working age population coming down. And therefore, this idea that companies will look beyond China on the back of the pandemic, on the back of growing trade tensions between China and the United States is now inevitably going to help India. The other thing, uh, the other thought is that some of the obituaries about China's growth have been written in the past wrongly so and China is a story which global leaders like to kick down. Look at the manner in which the economy is reopened after all the COVID cases and the debt stabilized and because Xi Jinping seems to be showing greater moderation and more pragmatism, China may not be as badly written off as many pundits would like to believe. Where do you see China go next? Uh, well, look, you know, uh, I just want to make one point here. Uh, what we find in China right now uh, is that they are sitting on about $1 trillion of excess savings of households who were in lockdown for three years. And as they gear to spend, uh, you know, that will provide some stabilization to global growth. Uh, you know, when you made the point that we will not have the hard landing I think a lot of that will come because now China is reopening and Chinese uh, households and consumers are ready to spend, are ready to travel. So from that perspective, you can't completely write off, uh, you know, a very large economy like China. Uh, there are uh, global value chains that are rejigging across the world for various reasons. A lot of people talk about deglobalization in growth and maybe there are uh, in, in goods and maybe there are not too many opportunities there. But I think where India has a big opportunity in front of it is a continuing globalization in services. Uh, I think, you know, we stand in a very unique position. We've been there from the the knowledge processing center days uh, to now the GCC, Global Capability Center days, when a lot of large multinationals want to put a lot of their research and back-end work in you know, places like India. And I think we really stand to gain on that part of the global rejigging of supply chains. Samir, now two things could happen in China. One, because of uh, pent-up demand on account of the economy and the country being shut for three years, uh, China is bouncing back, but this is temporary. It kind of falls to a new, a new level, which becomes the new normal for China. The other is that don't get pessimistic on China just yet because it could bounce back and stay high. Uh, what do you think will happen next? So, Rahul, very interestingly, if you look at the IMF forecast for India and China growth, uh, what strikes uh, is that over the next five years, uh, India's GDP growth is going to exceed Chinese growth. And that's going to happen first time after 1960s. For 1970s, 80s, 90s, 2010, 2020, 50 years, India's growth has always been lower than China. I think that way, it's a unique opportunity for India. Uh, but if I answer your question more directly, there are two things going on in China. Uh, one is the reopening trade. The other is the real estate trade. And both things can have very different implications for India. I think the re reopening trade, the $1 trillion excess savings that Pranjul was referring to, is going to be spent more on services. That's not going to cause much challenge for India. It's the real estate trade. If the Chinese real estate now starts picking up, that's going to create the next commodity price cycle. And that can destabilize the point that Shomo was mentioning about low inflation in India for 2023 being a tailwind for us. That theory can get questioned. And the last issue is that to what extent this China reopening would lead to a reallocation of capital flows in the EM space. We are already seeing that in the first few days of the year, uh, money has flown 
uh, got reallocated from India to China. The Chinese market valuations are much more attractive at this moment than the Indian valuations. So if this continues, then that can become some sort of a headwind. So commodity price effect and the capital flow effect are the two things that I will have to watch out for. Swami Kanti Ghosh, a lot of the current economic narrative around China was built at a time when the economy was shut. Xi Jinping acting as the ultimate emperor, taking impractical, irrational decisions that seem to be damaging the economy. The last few weeks, though, at great cost to Chinese health uh, infrastructure, has suggested much greater pragmatism. Does that then mean that a lot of the benefit that a country like India would have been hoping to get out of China's economic slowdown now just stays hawa me and doesn't actually materialize on the ground? I think that's an interesting point. But before that, let me just give you one data which we don't talk. I think in, the, in terms of the stock market resilience, India's... Uh, the market capitalization is increased in dollar terms 2.3 times than what it was in March 2020. So that's one of the impact of this China. Now specifically in terms of China, I just want to play a devil's advocate over here. I think China is always difficult to believe the data. So, uh, I mean, yesterday there were some numbers which were saying that 80% or 90% of the population is already going to get infected. And please note that China doesn't have an effective vaccination strategy for its population which India actually had, and India was able to quickly ramp up the vaccination for its population and in a war mode. So with the, with the country and given the type of disease it is, I mean the COVID, I think without an effective vaccination strategy, China may be reopening, China may actually, there could be some reallocation of capital. But over a point of time, I think India will stand at a far better advantage because no, after once this China reopens, and let's assume that 80% of the population has been infected, Whoever is vulnerable and susceptible suffers the consequences. A lot of people even die. But then the economy is open and people have immunity. So they can get back to business as earlier. Yes, but that will take time. For India also, we saw that, that vaccination strategy played out over a point of time. In, from May 2020, when they started to vaccinate the people, we were able to vaccinate a large part of the population in, the, in 2022 beginning. So if I go by that trend only, with the same population of China and India at this point of time, I think it will take a larger time to vaccinate this entire population. Till that point of, point of time, we can enjoy the, I mean, head, the tailwinds of the global economy. But of course, as China opens up gradually towards the end of the year, it could be an I mean, competition between the two. In the few minutes that I have left, I want to spend time talking about the outlook for GST collections. We've seen GST collections on a monthly basis hover in the range of about 1.5 lakh crore rupees. Is that, Pranjal, where you see uh, GST collections stay next, uh, next year? Do you see a potential for a moderate to high increase or do you actually see them come down on a monthly average basis? You know, it should uh, it should rise uh, in line with nominal GDP growth. But if you want it to rise even more sharply, like we saw over the last year, I think we need continued reforms in GST. We need to get more items into the GST umbrella. We need to talk about lower sort of lesser number of slabs, uh, more uniform rates. I think we need more reforms on GST if you if you want continued improvement. Uh, Which of course every economist and right thinking person would want. But Samir and are you concerned that given the practical reality of this being a general election year, that any reform, whether it is on the GST side, whether it is on tax or whether it is in terms of pushing through hard disinvestment, will actually now only be seriously considered after the 2024 general elections, or do you think that the government could potentially surprise? So just a quick point on GST is that this is a peculiar year where for the first time, the central government will be collecting 1.4 lakh crores of GST compensation says, but will not have to share with it with the state governments. So that's going to make the fiscal arithmetic look much easier uh, for the central government. But on the reforms question, I think where I started from is where I would want to end with. Private ca public capex is one area which I call reforms, which will have no political ramifications. So it's the easiest one to push even in a pre-election year. If you look at other reforms that economists typically talk about, there are winners and losers in those reforms. And typically every finance minister will be very considerate about 
implementing those reforms in a pre-election year. So I'm not penciling in too many of those reforms for this year, but public capex push is something which everyone likes, affects everyone positively. So why not do it? Swamya Kanti Ghosh, are you surprised with the government's approach on disinvestment? Arguably the most vexatious uh, PSU to disinvest was Air India, which got pushed through with a lot of determination and a lot of other strategic disinvestments, which should arguably have been easier to find a way to push through, have somehow not been done. And are you fearful that given the fact that we have an election, that a lot of this could be pushed out till after the next general elections? Yeah, the, I think the answer is both yes and no. In terms of the disinvestment, I believe that it more could have been done. But on this the, is what economists love to do. They like to give answers which have both yes and no and everybody else like normal citizens wondering, did he mean the yes more than or did he mean the no, no I'll, more? I'll explain that. But the good thing is that the government has been able to compensate that the decline in disinvestment revenue through and surge in the tax collections. The tax buoyancy ratio, which is historically at 1.1, means that it has been much higher in the last three years. So whatever has been the shortfall in the non-tax revenue has been compensated by the tax revenue and that is because of the efforts that the government has been doing. So in my sense, yes, there is an, there could be a shortfall in disinvestment or may not be that to the extent which we could anticipate. But my sense is that a large part of that will be offset by and buoyancy in the tax revenue. Now you have to explain the yes and no on disinvestment. It can either be a yes that they will push through on disinvestment despite it being a general election year or it can be a no, they are more likely to push it out till after the next elections and not take any panga at this moment. I think in terms of the disinvestment, some of these are very politically sensitive also in terms of the privatization. I think maybe that may not be touched this year. Maybe that could be pushed next year. But there is always this helping hand in terms of the tax fines. Okay, this was an interesting conversation. I want to thank uh, Pranjal, Samiran and Swamya Kanti Ghosh for joining us at the Business Today Market Today Summit and sharing your thoughts on India's economic outlook. Thank you so much. Thank you.